Good morning, folks. Uh, this is Ed Alcock from Alcock & Marcus. Welcome to the webinar, Navigating the Corporate Transparency Act. I'm gonna give it two minutes just to allow uh, additional people to join. Sometimes there's a little bit of a um, highway backup, if you will, when people are jumping on the Zoom at uh, 10 a.m. Um, this program is being recorded and we have a PowerPoint. If anybody wants uh, a copy of the PowerPoint or the recording, you can email me uh, at ed at amcondolaw.com or you can simply uh, type in the chat uh, with your information and we can provide it after the webinar is over. Happy Groundhog Day to everybody too. Um, I'm told that uh, Punxsutawney Phil, for the first time in many, many years, did not see his shadow today. So uh, apparently we get six weeks of spring. All right, we're at 10.01. I still see participants jumping in and it's kind of a function of Zoom. It just takes people a while to get into the thing. Um, I'll get started in another minute or two. All right, folks, so it's it's now 10.02. I see we've got participants still coming in. Let me reintroduce myself. Uh, my name is Ed Alcock. Uh, I am a partner at the law firm of Alcock and Marcus. We primarily represent uh, condominium associations and practice condominium law in Massachusetts, Rhode Island, New Hampshire, Maine, and Florida. So like I, I like to call that New England, um, and I consider Florida to be uh, Southern New England. Um, as, as I mentioned um, on the uh, at the beginning, um, we do have a PowerPoint. This session is being recorded. If you'd like to get a copy of the PowerPoint or the recording, you can either email me at ed at amcondolaw.com or you can simply type in the chat and we will get it to you after the webinar is finished. Uh, during the course of the webinar, I welcome you to use the chat function. And uh, if you have any questions, I'll try to answer them as I go. Um, and if not, uh, if I don't answer your question, uh, you can feel free to uh, email me at ed at amcondolaw.com. So the, the topic of today's webinar, uh, something I don't think I ever thought I'd be talking about as a condominium lawyer, navigating the Corporate Transparency Act. What is the Corporate Transparency Act? Um, it's an act that was put into place by Congress in 2001 um, and has only begun to have any sort of real meaning because uh, reporting for cer certain reporting entities, corporations, uh, LLCs, and other applicable entities, uh, which I'm gonna say for the most part involves condominium associations, begins in 2024. So let's talk about what that actually entails um, and what it's about. So there's a department uh, of the U.S. Treasury that's called uh, what I like to call them FinCEN. Um, it's the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network. Uh, the the issue, um, what what this is supposed to deal with, is to expand and fight anti money laundering efforts terrorist financing, corruption, tax fraud, and other illicit activity 
the concept, the idea is that individuals are using non-publicly traded corporations or LLCs to launder money, whether it's whether it's foreign interests, terrorist interests, um, and and commit otherwise illicit crimes uh, using shells like LLCs, corporations, uh, some of which have a lot of money running through them. And uh, you can't really tell who's who's involved or who the beneficial owners are of some of these smaller entities. Now, I say smaller, um, and we'll get into it in a bit, because there are numerous exemptions for entities that have other reporting requirements like um, publicly traded corporations, charities, so forth. So the concept is Congress is requiring non-exempt reporting entities to uh, provide uh, the name of the entity to FinCEN through the FinCEN database and uh, information about who owns or controls these entities. Um, and the information is specific. It's, it's um, taxpayer ID number for the entity, the address of the entity, the name of the entity, and then the identities of the beneficial owners. Um, uh, their date of birth, their residential address, and then here's kind of what I consider to be the most interesting part, uh, their ID number issued by the state in which they live, or if they don't live in the United States, um, an ID number issued by the state they live outside the United States, together with a state-issued photographic ID card, either a driver's license, or if you don't have a driver's license, uh, a state-issued uh, identification card that has the number, you know, you know the, 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 that same ID number on it. Um, I know in Massachusetts several years ago, I used to have my social security number on my uh, license they changed that. Actually, they forbid it. They now give you a uh, a generic uh, number that is not your social security number. So, so when you register with FinCEN, uh, when a beneficial owner registers, they have to punch in the ID number and then also download a photographic copy of their driver's license. Um, let me just switch to the next slide here. Whoops. So they the the supposed or stated purpose of this law again is to um, combat terrorism, combat uh, illicit crimes, money laundering. You know, for for LLCs, corporations that have a lot of money that um uh runs that runs through them um i actually believe that there's a little bit of an underlying purpose uh behind the act i, I think the government in in this case is building a database they want as many names as they can into this database and and i believe it's it's one of the starts of uh, a facial recognition database. Uh, might even be, you know, sort of a, a, a test run. Um, and, and I'll tell you kind of a funny story about uh, the government and facial recognition. Uh, about a month ago, I I went on a trip to Florida. Quick quick little jaunt down, and I I flew out of Logan Airport. And, and like many of you, I've gone through all the trouble to get one of these uh, real IDs. So my driver's license has that little stamp on it. I had to supply 18 
documents to the Massachusetts Registry of Motor Vehicles in order to get that real ID. I had to go get a birth certificate, had to show them what, like a utility bill, all kinds of stuff for them to verify that was me uh, and that's where I lived. So I go to the airport and I get into the security line. And I don't know if anybody's flown recently, but it's it's a little different now. Uh, instead of just going up to the to the person um, and showing them your driver's license, they ask you to put it in a machine. And and so I put it in this machine. It gets it gets sucked into the machine. They ask me to stand back and they take a photograph of me. And the reason they're doing that is is because they have a facial recognition program on the computer at at the airport security and they want to match up the picture of your face with the picture of your face on your license well for whatever reason that i was sitting there and they're like um sir it's not working can you can you put your chin up for whatever reason in my in my driver's license picture my chin is up so like oh can you move like this can you move your head uh so we kept doing it they must have taken 10 photographs of me and finally, the lady says, sir, it doesn't seem to be working. Can you stand over there? So, um, you know, I'm trying to get through security. They move me aside. I'm standing over in line here uh, aside. And then it happens to another guy. Um, and he's standing next to me. And within moments, the two of us are sort of planning our own little insurrection at the airport because we're like, what is the point of us getting this real ID? if it doesn't get us through the security line. Um, and then, you know, maybe about 20 minutes later, uh, a woman comes over, looks at our IDs, looks at our faces, and finally lets us go. Um, I found that to be very interesting. And and I think, you know, the with, with the advent of artificial intelligence, I think that's kind of where we're going. And and I think it's kind of interesting that that the government's already involved in it. That's why they want the um, that's why they want the licenses. And and again, I, I think here it's it's for a legitimate purpose. Um, the idea is uh, that it's to fight uh, terrorism and and crimes. But I just think the technology is sort of an interesting piece. I think that's why they want the photo IDs, and we'll talk later. That's why I think it's unlikely to, that that condominiums are are going to get a late exemption in this game because I think the government's more interested in building a database. So, um, who does the uh, federal uh, corporate transparency act uh, apply to? Well, it, it's it's a corporation. Uh, an LLC or any other entity that is created by the filing of a document with a secretary of state or any similar office under the law of the state. So um, in virtually every state but Massachusetts, um, condominium organizations, the uh, the the organization of owners takes the form of a nonprofit corporation or nonprofit association that has obligations to file with the secretary of state massachusetts is a little bit of an outlier for some reason when somebody started creating condominiums in massachusetts they are formed under the term condominium trust okay um however and and so there's no filing with the secretary of state but there's a filing at the registry of deeds and and we believe that to be a similar office um furthermore while in massachusetts we call them condominium trusts they're not really trusts they're not they're not real estate trusts or business trusts. Uh, all of the case law interpreting how they act and how they operate, um, uh, they've been analogized 
uh, to corporations. And, and let's think about it, right? The condominiums, they, they have unit owners, which in a lot of ways are analogous to shareholders. They have uh, elected boards of directors, um, again, analogous to corporations. Uh, in Massachusetts, there's a seminal case called Cody versus Levine that analogizes the structure of condominiums to corporations and even applies uh, the uh, derivative requirements under Mass Rules Civil Procedure 23.1 to certain cases uh, involving condominium associations. Um, they're not corporations in Massachusetts, but analogous. And I think notwithstanding the fact that we call them trusts, uh, I believe, uh, and and it's it's our legal opinion that the this act uh, applies to condominium associations in Massachusetts, just like they would in any other state. Now, even in Massachusetts, you have some um, some condominium associations uh, take the corporate form. Uh, not every condominium association in Massachusetts is a condominium trust. And like I said, the condominium trust concept is unheard of in any other state. Uh, the other states I practice, uh, most of the organizations are nonprofit uh, corporations. So um, again, the majority of my practice is in Massachusetts, but as I indicated, I'm also licensed in uh, Rhode Island and New Hampshire. Um, and uh, my firm practices in Maine and Florida as well. And like I said, I, I think the condominium trust thing is sort of an anomaly. And I, I can't believe that if we if we get down to it, um, that that FinCEN would say, oh, yes, Massachusetts, uh, your condominium associations are exempt because they have uh, a different form or formation than the condominiums in the other 49 states and uh, and and territories of the United States. Um, so our legal opinion and and on top of that, uh, you know, on something like this, where we're dealing with a requirement with the federal government, I think it's better to uh, err on the side of caution, uh, make the filing um, rather than rather than possibly put yourself in a situation where you're in violation of a federal law. Um, so I've already seen some questions in the chat about what entities are exempt from filing under uh, CTA, what entities don't have to report and then have their beneficial owners uh, file reports. So the, the majority of the exemptions, and there's 23 of them, relate to entities that have other reporting requirements that identify who the beneficial owners are, who the key employees are. Um, you know, and 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 it for the most part, it's for the most part, it's other entities that are highly regulated. So for example, banks, uh publicly traded entities. I'm gonna I'm gonna for fun, I'm gonna see how quickly I can go through all 23 exemptions. Uh exemption number one, security reporting insurer, a governmental authority, a bank, a credit union a depository institution holding company, a money services business, a broker or dealer in securities, a securities exchange or clearing agency, other exchange act registered entity, as in publicly traded corporation, investment company or investment advisor, venture capital fund advisor, insurance company, state licensed insurance producer, commodity exchange act registered entity, an accounting firm, a public utility, a financial market utility, um, a 501c3 or 501a entity. I'm going to get back to that in a second. 
an entity assisting a tax exempt entity, a large operating company. Large operating company is a company that's has 20 or more employees and within the last um, tax reporting period, filed a federal income tax uh, return showing that it had more than $5 million in gross receipts or sales. Um, and then there's other exemptions with respect to that one. Uh, and then a subsidiary of certain exempt entities. And then the last, uh, the 23rd, is an inactive entity. So like an LLC or a corporation that's been sitting out there. Um, it had to have been created before um, uh, 2020 and is not engaged in any active business, has not uh, sent or received any funds in excess of uh, $1,000, has not experienced any change in ownership in the preceding 12 month period. There's a lot of requirements to the to the inactive entity. So one of the one of the questions I got um, and some of the confusion is about what is a tax exempt entity. Um, nonprofits and, and people confuse it all the time. Nonprofits, which most condominium associations are, are not tax exempt entities. Tax-exempt entities are specific classified entities under uh, uh, 501C and 501A of the Internal Revenue Code. The, the, the typical one, the one I've dealt with uh, more often than not, is the so-called uh, 501C3 entity. I remember for years I was um, treasurer of the North Attleboro Soccer Club back when my kids were uh, soccer players. And that was a 501c3 charity. And 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 I, I think the reason uh, for the exemption on the 501c3 entities um, is because when, and, and I have some familiarity with dealing with their tax returns, is you had to identify as part of the filing who the key employees were, who the directors of the association were, what their addresses were. Uh, there was a lot more disclosure um, uh, on a 501A or a 501C income tax return. So again, the issue is, the, the, and I really think the reason a lot of these entities are exempt other than the, the, the 20 employee $5 million company um, is because there is significant information that is reported about the um, about the beneficial owners. So, um, unfortunately, that does not exist. Uh, most condominium associations, whether they take the form of a trust, whether they take the form of a nonprofit. Uh, corporation or unincorporated association file tax returns and the tax returns do not uh, have the the same requirements of information that a charitable organization has to put on their tax return. Um, so 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 let's let's assume for the moment uh, that you are, um involved with a corporation a uh, condominium association that has to report to FinCEN. Uh, I've kind of already gone over this but uh it doesn't hurt to identify specifically what they're looking for so so the first the first thing is the reporting company has to provide its legal name and or its trade name so you have some corporations that uh, have a legal name and then they they do business as uh, both should be reported the address the jurisdiction of formation or registration um, usually it's going to be the state in which the entity is operating but we know in the corporate world um, 
there's a lot of benefits to filing corporations in certain states. Like, uh, you know, I think the probably the most famous one is is Delaware, and then and then the taxpayer identification number of the entity. Then, what the entity has to report on the FinCEN um, database cloud website is the identity of the beneficial owners. And again, uh, I'm going to tell you how we figure out who's a beneficial owner. That is the individual's full legal name, their birth date, their residential address. Um, and then uh, there will be a line item for the ID number. Uh, ID number issued by a state or a foreign government. It is not your social security number. I've already spoken to a bunch of people uh, who are strangely worried about uh, reporting their social security number to the federal government. Um, and, and sort of the irony of that is the federal government's the one that issued you your social security number. Um, but it's not it's not your social it's it's the the identification number that you've been issued by your state usually in connection with the issuance of either a driver's license or a state issued identification card then as i indicated on top of it you have to download the the card a picture of your license um uh, that matches up with that number. So how do we know who is a beneficial owner in uh, in a reporting company? So what the regs say is it's anybody who directly or indirectly exercises substantial control over the reporting company or owns or controls at least 25% of the ownership interests of the reporting company. Um, the 25% is, I, I think, the default. But when you look at the regs and, and sort of the guidelines around the regs, they they talk about control. So 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 let's let's talk first. Um, in the condominium setting, it it is rare that you have any one person in a condominium that has or holds 25% of the beneficial ownership. Um, I say rare, it happens. I've seen it happen uh, probably more often than not with an association that is not fully sold out where the developer might still uh, be holding on or hanging on to 25% of the units. Um, but even even in I've I've seen it in smaller associations, or even some larger associations where somebody's come in and bought up a block of, of of the condominium. Um, but when it comes to condominium associations, the legal opinion that we've formed is who's in control of that. Uh, it's typically the board of directors, the board of trustees, the board of managers. Uh, they're the ones that are in control, exercising, making responsible for the day-to-day -day operations, the day-to-day, -day, um, the day-to-day -day decision makings over the operation of the entity. Um, the guidelines also talk about um, if you go back to the the corporate setting for a moment that. You know, in a corporation, if if nobody owns twenty five percent, all right. Well, who's who are the managing partners? Who are the who's on the board of directors? But they also talk about somebody that might not even own any shares, um, or has a minimal position in the entity that still is involved in day to day affairs. Uh, the the examples they give are somebody that um, and, and, and exercises substantial control over day to day affairs. The examples that they give um, are uh, ex officio 
uh, people, ex officio board members, emeritus board members, uh, retiring shareholders that that hold a prominent position. Um, and and one one thing that I think is worth thinking about in the condominium association world is sometimes you have documents where there is an ex officio seat. Sometimes it's reserved to the developer. Sometimes it's reserved to the to the past president or you know a, a chairman emeritus an emeritus position. So I I think as a general rule, the idea is going to be for for FinCEN filing purposes of BOI if you're a condominium association, um, it's going to be the board of directors. But I think from time to time, depending on the nature of your association, you might want to consult with your lawyer and say, oh, well, we have this ex officio seat or uh, the developer owns 27% of the units or we have this investor that owns 27% of the units. Should we have them um, also uh, file uh, a BOI with uh, FinCEN? So um, I, I'm seeing a lot of questions coming in. Uh, I, I'm probably going to reserve them to the end because I think a lot of them are going to get answered as as we go. So so what is the timeline for all this? So and, and how is this done? So so the BOI reports are filed electronically through FinCEN's secure cloud based filing system called the Beneficial Ownership Secure System, BOSS. Uh, and they have a website, you know, I, I went on and um, I did my FinCEN filing for my firm on January 2nd. Um, so, so the idea is if your company or your association was formed before January 1, 2024, you have until the end of this year to file the BOI report. And again, the BOI report is in order for it to be complete. It is the information for the company, the company or the organization, including its taxpayer ID number, and then every one of the individuals that is a beneficial owner. So if you're a condominium association and you have five board members, uh, it's complete when you file the information on behalf of the entity, and then all five board members file their information, including their date of birth, upload their their um, driver's license and and their address and so forth. Um, reporting companies created or registered on or after January 1, 2024, uh, initially had 30 days to file with FinCEN because there's been a little bit of a backlog or time gap in FinCEN getting their system up and running. That 30 days has been expanded to 90 days. Um, importantly, um, after the initial report is filed um, before December of 2020, uh, before January 1 of 2025, there are continuing obligations. Um, those Continuing obligations are whenever, and this is probably obvious, whenever the entity changes uh, in beneficial ownership. So if a shareholder leaves, somebody else gets over 25%. Uh, importantly, I think for condominium associations or homeowner associations, we all know this, they change frequently. Board members change frequently, usually annually, right? Maybe maybe it's all five of them, maybe it's one of them, uh, maybe it's two of them. So whenever there's a change that needs to be updated, the updating timetable is 30 days from a change. Uh, the same if there's a change of address. I don't think that's going to be a big deal when it comes to community associations because most of the board members tend to live at the property, but 
there are those where they're operated um, or somebody's on the board and their primary address is somewhere else, somewhere out of state. Uh, if the address, if their primary address changes, they're required to update their beneficial ownership information with um, FinCEN. And uh, one of the tricky ones is uh, license updates. So, and, and again, this kind of goes into the AI and the photographs uh, of your face. Every time you get a new license, they want you to go back in and upload your driver's license so that they have the updated photograph of your face. Um, you know, and uh, well, to me, that's, to me, that's kind of interesting. So the deadline, the initial deadline for all this is December 31, 2024. Um, I'm hoping people don't wait until then to pull this together especially if you're in a condominium association, because you kind of have to herd the cats. You got to get five or seven or nine or three people together to get licenses and um, uh, and, and addresses and, and taxpayer ID numbers uh, to get this filed. And then, and then we have to be on top of the changes. Now, I know in in my practice, whenever the board of directors of uh, a condominium or HOA changes, we file something either with the Secretary of State or the Registry of Deeds. And to me, um, what we should be trained to do um, going forward is whenever we file that change or have our lawyers file that change um, with the local entity, we should be making a similar change with uh, FinCEN and the federal entity. Now, why do we want to do this? Um, the the FinCEN is indicated in the, in the law, the Corporate Transparency Act says there is an enforcement mechanism. Um, violations of the reporting requirements include civil penalties of $500 per day for when you're out of compliance, not to exceed $10,000 and for potential imprisonment for up to two years. Um, can I tell you that the federal government's gonna be cracking down on non-compliance? No, I can't. Um, like I said, I, I think part of this exercise is for them to build a database, but I generally don't like to mess around with the federal government. Um, if the federal government wants you, they'll get you uh, and I, I think, um, you know, I always advise my clients to comply with the law and, and it's not that hard to do. And, um, you know, as a general rule, I like to avoid penalties for non-compliance. So I want to tell you about what, what we've done. So, so what, what we've done here at, at Alcock and Marcus is, uh, you know, we, we saw this coming uh, for for several months now. And it, what, I, what I wanted to do is try to make it easy for condominium associations and corporations to avoid having to herd the cats, if you will. Um, and and th th there's also a... Uh, concern by people in holding on to private data, right? So, so if, if in a perfect world, if if I had a great uh, organization, condominium association, I'd say, all right, well, um, you know, I, I'm I'm the president of the board, and I'm going to take care of this, and I'm gonna I'm gonna get the the organization's taxpayer ID number. I'm going to go to Bob and Mary's house and get photos of their IDs. Then I'll go to Jim's house and Joe's house, and and then I'm going to I'm going to do all this filing. Um, if I'm the management company, I don't want anything to do with this. I don't want to touch it. I don't want um, people's 
data being emailed to me. Um, and when I say data, I'm talking about a driver's license. Uh, I, I don't, I don't want it. Um, and I don't want to be responsible for it, uh, given the penalties and then given the concerns about, um, data breaches. So, so what I've done here, or I should say what we've done here is, is we've created a program and a portal to allow this to be done easily and simply and over, um, uh, you know, and over time and allow uh, our AI bots to hound the people that need to be hounded. And, and we've also developed um, with some technology, a um, AI program that allows us to alert people when they need to uh, file, particularly when their driver's licenses uh, expire. So, so, so what we do is we will file um, the the required BOI with FinCEN for your organization, um, keep you in compliance, uh, monitor changes going forward and and herd the cats for you. And we do it in a way that does not um, put your licenses in danger. Um, we're not having them sent to us via email. We've we've um, we've we've utilized our technology um, guy to create this portal. Uh, it's on our website. Um, at amcondolaw.com under resources. If you go under resources, you'll see it um, under uh, beneficial owner uh, report. And, and it allows you to go on there. And I'm going to run a demonstration for you in a moment and uh, identify at, at, at each associations and board members or corporations leisure. Identify the name of the entity, the taxpayer ID number, and then each owner at their leisure or each beneficial owner or board member inputs their own information. Um, and, and preferably the way it'll work is uh, either a board member or a manager emails us the names and the emails of the individuals that need to file the report so that our bot can uh, follow up with them uh, and and say, okay, we now have, and, and we get a message, we now have three in the portal. We now have four in the portal. Oh, we have five in the portal, it's ready to file. And then we, once all the information's in that portal, um, we take it and we file it with FinCEN our artificial intelligence bot pulls from the driver's license when your driver's license expires and calendars it. And then uh, in the future sends an email to that individual, assuming that they're still on uh, the board, assuming that they still have a beneficial ownership interest and actually I think provides a really cool, great service, better than the service that's provided by the Registry of Motor Vehicles in Massachusetts. And we tell you, hey, your license is gonna expire in 60 days. Please update your license. And when you've done so, um, uh, send us a photo so that we can uh, update your information in uh, uh, with the federal government. Um, uh, and, and that's kind of an important point so when when there needs to be an update, let's say let's say it's it's uh, 2026, and 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 one person comes off the board, and one person goes on the board, um, we only need that additional one person's information, unless driver's license or addresses have changed, which again, um, with with the AI we've built into our um, portal, we're able 
to monitor um, for you. So um, the interesting thing I think is, is, is we're trying to make this easier for condominium associations. We're trying to provide a service. This is, this is a, what I consider to be an intrusive, um, aggravating uh, law uh, enacted by the federal government. And um, we're trying to provide a service to make it as, as less intrusive and more convenient um, for corporations their directors and condominium associations, their board members, and particularly their managers. We're trying to we're trying to keep uh, the, being a condominium or community association property manager is hard enough. Um, you know, you guys are dealing with uh, uh, leaks, roofs, loans, um, a million other things. The last thing you want to be doing is collecting. Uh, driver's license or chasing somebody down for their for their driver's license. So, so we figure this is probably the easiest way to do it and to monitor it. And we've invested in in the infrastructure. Um, let me tell you, uh, it, it, it's not easy to create one of these one of these portal things. Um, not even I, I mean I'm not even really sure what it is. Uh, I'm just a lawyer. I'm not that technologically advanced. It was only a few years ago that I moved up from my BlackBerry to an iPhone. Um, but but it's kind of interesting uh, in dealing with the uh, technology guys as to how it was built, and then and then the firewalls uh, that that have to go in because we want it to be secure because you're transferring driver's licenses to our portal so that we can uh, comply and monitor that for you going forward. Um, and, and let me tell you, it's not cheap uh, to do this stuff. And then like everything else, it's you build it and then, oh, we got to add this, we got to add that. There's a subscription for this, there's a subscription for that. But this is what we do. Um, you know, we, uh, myself, uh, Jake Marcus, Steve Marcus, we we like to pride ourselves on 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 being condominium nerds, providing education and providing service, which is why we're also out there uh, uh, trying to uh, help you folks with the Fannie Mae blacklist, which which is another webinar. Um, but so 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 what we're doing, and and I'll just tell you, it's it's a one time uh, five hundred dollar fee. So it's not expensive to your association to do it. It's really me. Um, you know, it's not like I'm making a, a, a killing on this. It's about trying to uh, offset the costs and provide the service. And and what we do, because because I know there's been some discussion um, about, well, well, when should we file? Should we wait until December 31st to file? Uh, God, I hope not. Um, I, I don't want to be like my accountant. I, I see my accountant. He's kind of like a, he's a great jolly guy. He's like 200 pounds. I see him in February. He's happy. He's fat. Then I see him on uh, like May 1st. He's like lost 30 pounds because he spent all of April 14th and 15th filing uh, those late filing uh, last minute tax returns. Um, now, to me, the most, uh, and, and I think I've already mentioned this, the most sensible time for associations to work with us to get this filed through the portal is probably when you're filing your annual update, either with the Secretary of State as to who the uh, directors are or, the, or the, a trustee certificate in Massachusetts as to when you're identifying who your trustees are, but you can do it now. Um, and and what our program is, is, is you know, for, again, for that $500 fee, um, we um, will not charge anything else for any updates made to your beneficial ownership filing within 
12 months of your initial filing. So, so let's say somebody files on February 2nd, and then, uh, I don't know, let's say somebody resigns. So, so I, I get all the information today. We, we run around through the portal, we get you filed with FinCEN. And then let's say one of your board members resigns on June 30th and somebody gets appointed on July 1st. Well, uh, send us the information and um, we'll upload it at, at no additional charge. Uh, interestingly enough, one of the associations that I have that's already filed, we uh, our bot notified him that his driver's license expires in 60 days. So he has to, um, and he, by the way, he was very thankful. He's like, God, you're better than the registry. Um, uh, thanks for letting me know my license expires because in Massachusetts, they don't tell you when your license expires anymore. You remember back in the day, you used to get like a postcard or something. They don't even tell you anymore. Um, uh, I got a funny story about that too, but I, I don't know that I want to get into it. Um, coming home, well, maybe I will get into it. Coming home from a Patriots game one night, I got into a into a minor fender bender, and it was it was Tom Brady's last game, uh, and uh, the police came, and uh, the officer's like, "Okay, you exchange your information, so forth and so on." And it was a night game, and he looks at me and he says, "I see a license." Looks at my license. He goes, "He goes, he goes, you can't drive." I said, "What do you mean?" Uh, he goes, "Sir, it." Uh, it, it happened to be my birthday. It, it was January 4th, uh, 2020. He goes, uh, sir, your license expired five minutes ago. I'm like, really? Come on. Uh, he goes, he goes, you can try to go online right now and, and, and get a new license. I'm like, no, he goes, so he goes, someone else is going to have to drive. And then he looks at my brother who's sitting in the passenger seat and he's like, not him. Um, so uh, the interesting thing is is we've already had somebody their their license has expired uh we've notified him of that through our ai um he's getting it updated once he gets it updated he's gonna download it to our portal we'll get a notification it's in our portal and then we'll upload it to fincen um so th that's what we've invested in i think uh the idea is to make it easier for uh every association to get this done without the ha hassle, the headache will herd the cats. Um, and like I said, most importantly, your data is going to be secure. That's why we've created the portal. That's why we've created the firewalls. That's why we have the cybersecurity um, uh, uh, rider to our insurance policy. Uh, it's to keep you at peace of mind, to assist you with what I consider to be this annoying and overburdening law. Now, um, there is a little bit of a buzz about um, a possible exemption coming for condominiums. I know that uh, CAI National is, is working feverishly to do that. Um, like I said, I, I this law was passed in 2021, so I, I think the time for exemptions uh, has come and gone. I, I can't imagine Congress is going to create an exemption after the reporting period has begun. Um, uh, I, I like I, I know they're working on it. I'm hopeful. You know, it'd be great if I know there's some people on this call that are working on it. I know Steve Marcus is. On the federal lack, he's working on it. The the thing we can all hope for an exemption in the future. The problem is the law is in effect now. I'm encouraging people uh, when the law is is in play to comply with the law. Uh, could there be an exemption on no, in November or July or September or October? Sure. Um, I don't anticipate it. And, and the reason I don't anticipate is, as I've stated throughout, is I think the federal government is interested in creating a database. The more uh, the more information, the bigger that database, the more photos, the more faces, the bigger that 
facial recognition database. Um, I don't think it's coming. However, if it does come, what and 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 you've used our office to make this filing through our portal and and you've spent the five hundred dollars, I'll give you a credit um, for the five hundred dollars towards something else. Like I said, this isn't about um, making money. This is about providing uh, what I think is an important service, taking putting your mind at ease for uh, condominium associations to comply with this annoying law. Um, like I said, I, I think that probably the best time for you guys to do this is when the the certificates are being filed at at the registry or the secretary of state. Um, I'd hope you don't wait for the December 2024 rush. So I don't have all of my staff here on uh, New Year's Eve trying to to get these filings um, done. Uh, and 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 I don't. Although I don't know, maybe there's some benefit to that. Like my account, maybe I can lose, I, I can lose 20 pounds uh, at the last minute doing that. Um, so that that's the that's it, folks. That's the presentation. I've seen a lot of people on here asking for the recording or the slideshow. Uh, I'm going to get that to uh, people. Um, going to try to go through some of the questions. Um, you know, uh, I I think I've I think I've uh, answered most of them. What I'm seeing. Um, so I, I saw one where somebody said, uh, you know, since 2018, LLCs have opened business accounts, have had to submit a BOI form with personal information to their bank. Do they have to submit to FinCEN if they've already reported similar information to their bank? And the answer is yes, they do. Um, uh, the the fact that you've reported or given your license to the, to your bank or your personal information to your bank does not exempt you from having to provide this information to the federal government. Um, someone asked me if management companies should be providing the reporting service. Um, I'm going to probably say no to that. Um, and, and the reason I'm going to say no uh, and, and I know that there's um, a accountant on this call who has spoken to me um, uh, 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 about FinCEN reporting. I know his accounting company doesn't want to get involved in it um, for the for the reasons of, um, quite frankly, it's in, in some respects it can be deemed to be legal advice. You know, there are going to be situations where a legal opinion needs to be made as to who the beneficial owners are. And then um, the other question is, is, you know, whoever is doing the reporting for you, um, do you want them holding the information? How do you get the information to them? Um, are you, uh, you know, is there any concern about uh uh, privacy and or data breach. Um, someone here said, you know, uh, small associations of three, everyone has more than 25%. I agree with that. Um, usually in those associations, we have a lot of those in Boston, those three units or four unit condominiums, a lot of them in South Boston. Usually in those cases, everybody's got 25%. And, and in those cases, on top of the 25%, everybody has um, a seat on the board. So you might qualify in two ways. You're in control as you're a board member and you have more than 25%. Um, uh, percent. Um, I, I, someone asked the question that I've seen some legal opinions that say an association that elects to file form 1120H is effectively a nonprofit and thus exempt from this. 
Uh, the answer to that question, um, and 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 some of the folks and myself on this call have been engaged in communication with some accountants across the country on this very issue. The regulations say 501c3 or 501a. You are a nonprofit corporation. Not all nonprofit corporations are 501c or 501a. Those are usual, usually charities. Uh, there are very few, uh, although there are some, there are very few HOAs uh, and condominium associations that are 501A or 501C. I would say less than less than 1% um, nationwide. Uh, it's a very small number. Um, so the, the answer to your question is uh, the, the, the regulations give an exemption. They do not give an exemption for nonprofits. They give an exemption for 501C and 501A. If you're not a 501C and a 501A, you are required to report. Um, so one of the questions is who on the board submits their photo ID? The answer to that is all, all board members. Um, and, and, and that's part of the, you know, that, that's part of the reason why I think the portal is a good idea. Um, uh, all board members um, have to submit. And by the way, why don't why don't I see if I can take you through uh, our portal? I just want to show it to you. Uh, so th this is where it is. It's amcondolaw.com beneficial ownership information report. And so you'll you'll come here, and uh, each board member identifies the name of their condo, trust, or corporation, any DBAs, the address, jurisdiction, taxpayer ID number. Now, the next thing on our dropdown is what I expect ordinarily is going to be each director or each trustee is going to fill out this on my portal or our portal by themselves. So if you fill out by yourselves, then you you keep this number up here one. Now I do envision scenarios, right? Where you might have a, a, a board member or a trustee who's not terribly um technology proficient, right? Maybe doesn't even have a computer. And so maybe Mary says, all right, well, Bob, I'll take care of yours for you. Um just give me a just give me a picture of your license, right? So okay, so you get a picture of of, of Bob, Mary gets a picture of Bob's license and then she comes to our portal and then she clicks the drag down two. So then she fills out her information right here. Um, uh, uh, drags the photo into, into this spot and then she fills in Bob's and then she hits submit. Now, maybe, maybe there's some industrious, director or trustee who says, you know what? I really want this done. I'm going to go get all five of my board members' licenses. And and I'm going to fill this out for everybody because I want this done. I'm going to get this over to Alcock so we can get it filed. Well, he goes to the, th to the little thing here. He clicks out five. And then he's going to fill out all five of these things. And then he hits submit. And, and we go and we go there. So let me continue to answer some questions. What does BOI stand for? <laughs> Sorry, I use an acronyms. So the two in acronyms with Corporate Transparency Act are CTA, um, Corporate Transparency Act. BOI is Beneficial Ownership Information. Um, so somebody asked, does one individual report for all or does each member need to register individually? Um, I think I've answered that question it's not complete until all beneficial owners have filed. Uh, so if one board member wants to herd the cats or you want uh, us to herd the cats, um, you can do it either way. Like I said, with the, the number one drop down or the number five drop down up here, 
Um, and like I said, the portal notifies us when anybody files. Um, and if we need, and, and, you know, we have the ability through our portal and the AI to chase down the stragglers and then make sure that we've collected all five, the, the necessary information um, and, um, and, and do it for you. But, but you can have one trustee do that um, uh, yourself. I, I, I did see somebody say, I highly doubt condo associations are a hotbed of terrorist cell fundings. This is a huge overreach by the feds. I don't disagree with that. Um, uh, but, you know, I think part of this is the feds, you know, we the condominiums and HOAs didn't get an exemption. Part of it is about them creating the database. However, however, there have been scenarios where there have been significant um, financial crimes at condominium associations. And, and I do think the federal government is aware um, of certain, uh, you know, and I, th I think Florida is a hotbed of it right now, where uh, condominiums are being torn down and uh, being bought with uh, foreign investor money, uh, whether it's Saudi or Chinese. So those will be scenarios when when new towers are going up. Um, the the board is going to be controlled by the developer and and let's be honest some condominium associations uh whether it's in massachusetts rhode island uh florida um we've got a lot of new towers in boston there are millions of dollars running through uh some of these associations and and it's not just terrorism it's it could be money laundering or significant financial crimes one of which could be embezzlement, right? Um, pyramid schemes, things like that do occasionally happen. Um, do occasionally happen. It's not, it's not every day, um, but they do occasionally happen. Uh, so someone asked, what happens if a board member refuses to cooperate with the providing of the information? Um, well, I, I think... If they fail to do that, um, you know, maybe we can uh, try to convince them that this is not that big a deal. Um, you know, uh, I, I know some of the initial concerns I got back or feedback from people, as I mentioned already, was Social Security numbers. Like I said, I mean, who cares? I mean, the government already has your Social Security number. People are objecting to sometimes people just get stuff in their head uh, or they're obstinate. Um, th they already have your, your social security number. Um, uh, and hopefully, you know, and I'd be happy to help assuage them that this is not that big a deal. Um, hell you go to the, you go, if, if you fly, you go to Logan airport, uh, you, you're giving them your driver's license and they're taking a picture of you for God's sakes to match it up. So it's not that big a deal, but if your board member is really, really, really that obstinate, um, I mean, my recommendation probably is going to be to explore, you know, uh, having them uh, replaced because, um, you know, I, I think it's more important for your uh, uh, organization to be compliant with federal law than not. Um So I, I've got somebody that says, so a condominium association that is not registered with the state as a legal entity would be exempt from this. Um, I know of no condominium association that is not registered with the state in some form or fashion, whether it's the Secretary of State's office or the uh, Registry of Deeds. Um, I, I do not know of any association that has not been created through the filing of a document uh, at 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 the Registry of Deeds, um, maybe there's one out there. I know of none. Um, uh, someone asked me if we do this outside of uh, our geographical area. Um, that's something uh, that I, I I'd ask you to 
as far as geographical area, I practice or my firm practices in five states. Um, if, if there was someone asking if we could do this in in you know for clients outside of our jurisdictions, I don't. I think the answer to that would be no. I would I would view this as um, providing legal advice um, within that state. I can't practice law in a state so. So could I collect this information and file it for a condominium in Colorado? Uh, the answer would be no, but I could probably point you in the direction of somebody in Colorado or California or Georgia. Um, somebody said it'd be great if there's a one pager to provide to the board uh, to explain what is needed and what we'll do. Uh, I will uh, do my best to get you that, Elizabeth. Um, someone said what happened when board members change. I think I've already explained this. The, the, the incoming board member needs to provide their information. Um, I, I think it's perfect, um, uh, perfectly done when the new certificate, uh, is, is, um, filing. Someone said, are the HOAs included in the reporting? Uh, yes. Uh, the very first part of the reporting is um, the name of the association of the entity, their address, their jurisdiction of formation. Remember we talked about, are you, know, you formed in Delaware, Massachusetts, and the entity's um, uh, uh, taxpayer ID number. Someone asked me is, does the board have to give you permission to go ahead with this? Are you working with the management companies? Um, I'm working with both. Uh, I, I've had, a couple of management companies actually already approach me and say, look, we're just going to tell our folks to give, um, uh, tell our managers to work with you directly. They're going to send you an email with the trustee certificate when they do this. And then uh, you're going to send them a link to the portal and, and it's going to, you know, so, so it could be either way, either the board can work with us, directly or through the management company it's 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 up to it's up to you folks um let's see what else do we have uh more about the um so oh someone asked me will will my our program work for non condominium entities the answer is yes is there a filing fee outside of our program by the government the answer is no just a penalty if you don't do it. And and yes, our program does work for non-condominium entities. You'll see at the top here, it's condominium association, trust, or uh, corporation. <clears throat> um, and actually, it's it's kind of interesting for certain, I, I, I have one client who has um, 82 entities um, in various forms of life. Uh, he's a developer. And for an entity, for, for, for someone like that, who has many entities, uh, there's a, there's a way to relieve the administrative burden of filling out, um, 82 forms and, and resubmitting the driver's license 82 times. It's called a FinCEN identification number. Um, I, I think that's going to be rare, but but for those people who are interested in dealing with corporate entities, uh, and if you have a lot of them, like like that one client I have, um, happy to discuss that with you. Um, yeah, so John, uh, someone asked me, are you offering the service to non-OHOA business entities? The answer is yes. Um, uh, someone asked, can we clarify what it is we need to do exactly within the next 90 days and what we have until December 31 file. Okay, so confusion there. So if your entity is created in 2024, okay, 2024, you have 90 days to fill out the information um, that appears here on my website, which is the name of the entity, the address, jurisdiction, taxpayer ID number, then identify who your beneficial owners are, with their driver's license and and the photographs. Um, so so if you if you created an entity on January second of 
2024, you have to do this by April 2nd. If your entity uh, or condominium existed before 2024, you have until the end of the year to do this. Once, once you file, let's say I file, uh, and, and I filed for my um, company on January 2nd, I wanted to be one of the first. Um, if if there is a change in the beneficial ownership interest, um, if I if I say I've had enough of practicing law and I'm going to go play golf in Florida and leave this whole thing to Jake, um, we have 30 days uh, from that change of when I leave um, to update the system with FinCEN. Um, the, the, one of the benefits of using our portal with the built-in AI is, is that we're going to monitor that for you. Uh, again, the driver's licenses, um, when we get the trustee certificates and the, and the, and the filings with the secretary of state, we're going to see when board members terms expire and, we're going to try to 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 use our uh, bots to stay ahead of that for you. Um, so uh, somebody asked me talking about board members or developers or owners with more than twenty five percent. The answer is yes. So so one question was, do we need to report for board members if someone owns? 25% or more, the answer is yes. You report for the board members and the individual that owns more than 25%. Um, uh, uh, oh, actually, very interesting from uh, Ken Bloom, my accounting friend, uh, who says that condominiums that file 1120H um, operate without a profit motive, but are not profits, but but are not, not nonprofits as defined in federal tax law. Um, uh, so it, to me, that's kind of interesting and even more of a reason why associations uh, should be filing. Um, Oh, someone just said that they can't see the portal. Um, oh, that's unfortunate. Uh, I, I thought that the um, that the portal was viewable. I can see it on my screen. Um, well, in any event, go go to um, AM Condo Law uh, under Resources Beneficial Ownership Information Report. And you'll be able to to see the portal. It's very easy to use. Uh, it's very simple. Someone asked me, would this also apply to owners of apartment buildings? Um, uh, the answer is yes. If if the apartment building is held in a LLC or uh, a uh, corporation, I apologize that people could not see the portal. Um, that's unfortunate. I don't know why that did not work. Um, let me see if I can actually let me see if I can actually do that. If I can try to, uh, I, I, I don't really know how to figure that out. Um, apologies. Go to AM Condo Law. You will see. You will see the portal. Um, I have it up on my screen now. Can anybody see that? You know what? You know what I I will also do, folks. Um, uh, yeah. Somebody asked me, FinCEN is the entity this is filed with. The answer is yes. Um, what I will do is when I send out the PowerPoint to anybody that wants it, I will include uh, a screenshot of our portal. Um, uh, uh, someone asked me if the portal is mobile friendly. I believe it is. Um, uh, and yes, uh, photos can be uploaded from the cell phones. 
Um, uh, yeah, and 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 that's how I did it. I I just took a picture of my own uh, license with my cell phone. Um, will cooperatives be impacted as well? I, I think the answer to that is yes. Most cooperatives I've dealt with um, take the form of a corporation. Um, uh, someone asked me four unit condominium, two units not registered as trustees, but they each have a 25% interest. I think the answer is uh, to be safe, I would have all four file. Um, uh, someone asked me, someone said, property managers handle huge amounts of money. Um, uh, and, and like me, uh, property management companies, they have to do their own filing, um, unless they meet one of the, one of the exemptions. Some of them might, some of them might have more than 20 employees and, um, uh, more than $5 million in gross uh, uh, receipts from the prior year based on a, on a filed tax return. I mean, I know we have some, some very big property management companies, national companies, some of them may fall within uh, the exemption. Um, uh, someone said, uh, even though IRC code 528 makes homeowner associations tax exempt, is it your opinion that since they are not specifically 501C, are they still subject to this? The answer to that is yes. Um, the, the exemption under, uh, under the um, regulations is for 501C or 501 a entities. It is not. It is not for um, entities that are classified as nonprofit or entities that the tax code defines as as a, an entity that is exempt from taxation. I, uh, as a lawyer, and 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 again, this is why this is a legal question. As a lawyer, I look at the law, and it says these entities are exempt. It does not say tax exempt entities are exempt. It says entities that are exempt under 501A or 501C. Um, can a, someone asked me, can a small condominium file directly with FinCEN? Sure, I, I, they can. Um, however, that small entity um, uh, needs to make sure it's done correctly and that that there is a monitoring and follow-up program anytime there are changes uh, that require uh, amendments to be filed within 30 days. Um, someone said, can you send out the information on the portal to the participants on what the advantages of using the portals? Um, I think I've kind of gone over it, uh, and I will, uh, yeah, maybe I'll try to include that in, in the one pager. Um, uh, uh, someone asked me, would we be willing to file if you are not a client? The answer is yes. Uh, by filing, then you would become a client. We can represent a client for a limited purpose. We don't need to represent you for everything. Um, and who knows, maybe maybe you'll find that we're actually good at this and good at other things. Um, like I said, we've put this together. Um, we, really, we really pride ourselves on education and trying to stay ahead of the curve and making life easier for community associations. So uh, we'd love to... Um, uh, uh, help you with this. Someone asked about the FinCEN identification number. It is on their website. Google it. Um, uh, someone just said that did work. Close the side slideshow. So I, I guess maybe it did work. Um, uh, so I, I guess I had to switch windows. Um, we'll send the PowerPoint. 
Um, I appreciate everybody spending an hour and a half with me on a Friday morning and uh, listening. Um, if there's anything I can do to help, send me an email, ed at amcondolaw.com. Uh, and otherwise, please go to our website at amcondolaw.com. Go to resources and and uh, drag down to beneficial ownership information, and you will see what is currently on your screen. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, I really appreciate you spending Groundhog Day with me.